Hey guys, welcome to today's video. I'm gonna be interviewing another Bruce Williams here. This is my father, my namesake. Uh, he's visiting from out of town here and I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to interview you about your daily wear watch, where you've been in your journey and where you plan on going in the future. So I think it's a topic that a lot of people are gonna be able to relate to. So as we begin, let's do a little wrist check here. I'm wearing uh, the GMT Master 2 from Rolex, and, and what are you wearing? I'm wearing the Mega Seamaster, love it. Yeah, so this is your daily wear watch. You've been wearing it for about almost a year straight, right? Yeah. What do you like about it? I like its quality, I like its durability, I like its design and its updated design. Um, so there's a lot I like about it to, when you compare the journey that I've been through. So let's start with your journey. Um, I'm gonna pull one of these watches up okay. and, and hold it up. This is a watch that my, I remember my father wearing one of these for years. I think it's a 33 millimeter quartz Jacob Jensen. Kind of minimalistic and modern. And I think we were talking one day, I was getting into watches and you were like, oh, let me show you my watch. And, yeah. and I kind of poo-pooed it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's all right. You, pol <laughs> you politely told my watch was a piece of junk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, there's actually two of them here because you, you wore something like this on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> I probably wore those both for a total of 15 years. Yeah. Um, um, so what got you, was it my comment, my slight comment that got you yeah. looking at watches? <clears throat> yeah, and at that time you were wearing Christopher Ward, you had an S SKX. Yeah. Um, so I had not thought about mechanical movements at all. Yeah. And so... I'm probably like a majority of your subscribers where I just started on this journey in mechanical watches and the more I learned the better I liked it. Particularly when you consider this is a piece of uh, a design, well not this one but the mechanical ones are a design that uh, don't require any power. Yeah. They just, just they just need to be moved and they work. So that's fascinating to me. Yeah. So <clears throat> you started with more entry level stuff yeah. in your beginning stages. We have a couple of Orients here that I've actually reviewed. I've borrowed these watches in the past few years. Uh, very good value with these Bambinos, right? They're yeah. inexpensive, but what do you think about them? Well, <clears throat> I actually, when I sat down with you one day and yeah. you just started showing me watches online. Yeah. And I was drawn to the, the divers because they had this bezel that rotated and they had this water resistance and they had this look about them. And so I remember getting a Christopher Ward, a Squally, and a Helios Tropic. Mm -hmm. And I had those for a couple months. And I think I'm probably like others where you know pretty quickly if you like it or not. Yeah. And Pretty quickly, I knew I, I didn't want it. And so I went to an Oris. Yeah. A 40 meter, 40 meter that one. Oris. Silver that, Dial. Silver Dial. That was, I actually saw that on a YouTube channel called The Dutch Sandwich. And I thought it was beautiful. And, and that's the thing about divers, most of these divers, they're not really for diving. No, they're, <laughs> they're for show. They're death but, diving. But I like their design. Yeah. And uh, I like the complication and their, the toolness of it. It's nice because. You know they're waterproof. They've got good low light visibility with the luminescence, and then you always have the timer to time something up to an hour. So, you know, really, they make great everyday watches, yeah. even if you don't dive, right? Yeah. So, so I had that AUKUS for maybe a year, and then I felt I was ready to make to make the next step. Yeah. And that was to get what I thought was the most beautiful watch I've ever seen. Yeah. And that was a Grand Seiko SBGE001. Yeah, the, the Spring Drive GMT. Yeah. The first GMT that they did with the Spring Drive tech. Yeah. yeah. And I got that and it was so remarkable to me uh -huh. that I didn't want to wear it. And It was slightly intimidating? Yes, I wasn't ready. And, and maybe uh, your viewership has some insight into this journey where you might go for this high, higher end watch, yeah. and then you get it and you go, uh-oh. You're like, man, I'm, I've been used to wearing $300 Seikos, and now I've got a $3,000 yes. Grand Seiko. I don't know yes. if I can wear this and do the same activities. Yep. I, I, I think a lot of people can relate to that. So, you know, maybe maybe your audience has some insight is, why is that that 
we kind of had that sort of reaction. Yeah. But I will say that now I'm ready for nicer pieces. Yeah. And I think uh, it takes time uh, for you to get to that point. Yeah. I mean, where I'm at now with this, this is a $4,000 watch. And you wear it every day and you're not worried about it. I'm not it. worried about it. And I never would have gotten here if I would not would have not done what I did before. Uh -huh. So getting the experience with the affordables, the mid levels, the Grand Seiko, it's been a journey. Yeah. Whereas if you started out straight with the Omega, you don't think it would have been a positive. I would have. Experience. I wouldn't have done it. You probably. And in would. fact, if you would have never said this is a piece of junk, Dad, <laughs> I would have never got been here. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we have these experiences in life that bring us to opportunities. And so, what I do when I get a watch is I sort of um, do a little study. So you're you're pretty methodical. Like we have a layout here. Uh, and we're going to talk about these here in a minute, but these are watches that interest you. Yes. So take us more through the process of... Well, um, you know, my, my Grand Seiko purchase was an emotional purchase. Mm -hmm. I've since gone into a more logical purpose of researching. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of you out there do that. This is what I do. And so I, I usually cast a wide net mm -hmm. and then I, I sort of winnow out those watches that I pretty much don't think I like. And the interesting thing, Bruce, yeah. is that every watch purchase I've ever made was by watching a video online. I've never been able to see anything in person. Yeah. And then so we go out and we buy this watch and we finally get it in person and we go, oh. You're like, yeah, I like it for two weeks yeah. or a month. <laughs> and, and I will talk to this is that when I got this Seamaster, I will say that the first two weeks I wasn't sure about it. Really? Because it was heavy. It is. Uh, it's got the little wart on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's important that you take the time to test it. And after about a month of wearing it every day, my body didn't complain about its weight. Yeah. Uh, every time I looked down at it, I liked it even more. So then I knew. That you got is, the right one. This, I got the right one. Yeah. And not only the right one, but I got a deal. Yeah. Because... You know, when I look at your Master GMT Master mm -hmm. Two, it is by far the better watch than this. Right. But not for four thousand dollars. Oh no, it's it's so. it's ridiculously more expensive, and the diminishing return of the difference between the two, most people would say, is not worth the, the disparity there. Yeah. Uh, compared to like your enjoyment that you get from it. Yeah. Right. So I feel like I've got as much uh, workmanship and design than you do. Mm -hmm. it, this is a better watch. But for the for what I spent on this, less than half of what less I less than half. I am so happy with this. Yeah, and someday it's going to be yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's look at you know you're looking at some other watches now, and mm -hmm. you've kind of talked about your process, and I like that because at least I, I get this way sometimes, and I think a lot of you can relate where you get excited about when you see something. And I keep a list, like I, I have a list of watches that I want to try out. And sometimes after a month or so, they'll, they'll go down. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go out and buy one, but I still like it and I yeah. still appreciate it. But some of these ones throughout your process, throughout your methodical process, mm -hmm. things will rise to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And those ones are likely to be those long-term ones that you really bond with and enjoy right. because you're not rushing out to buy something that you're going to sell in a month. Right. Like you've done the research. Right. You've done the homework. I understand that you have to continually go through watches just yeah. to present this, but I am looking for one or two watches and that's it. Yeah. So I want them to be really good. Yeah. Um, and you want me to go through this? Yeah, let's go through a few. Okay. So I think if you were, if in my, and I've established a budget for myself. Mm -hmm. I've established a budget from three thousand to ten thousand. It's a good range. And if it happens to be a three thousand dollar watch, and that's the winner, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But the first one I looked at was the Nomos Orion, and the one particularly, it's a, a special model. I think it's for timeless luxury timeless watches. Timeless luxury in Texas. It's a blue dial with gold indices, and I think if you are out there, and a lot of my decisions come from how much are you willing to spend. Yeah. I think that's true of most people here. Mm -hmm. And this is a watch you can get for about $1,500 or less. It's a yeah. manual wine. It's got a great case back. But in the end, 
<clears throat> I feel like it's not a watch that will be timeless for me. Yeah. And so it was in that initial the sweet short the list. Yeah. But I'm taking it out. Another one is the Omega Seamaster, the, the I mean, Speedmaster. Speedmaster, the uh, Apollo, Apollo 11 Anniversary Edition, that the recent one where there's the limb module and on the back there's a yeah. boot footprint. And the reason I chose that is, and I'm not particularly interested in a chronograph, but I was there as a nine-year-old boy and watched that spaceship take off. And so when I look at that, okay, okay, maybe this is some sentimental watch I can have, but in the end, I don't think you can purchase a sentimental watch for yourself. Yeah. Maybe if your mom did it for me, it would be <laughs> a different story. So I'm taking that one out of the, out of the running. Um, then we've got a long jeans. We've got a heritage collection, a flagship, very nice, very minimal. I'm hoping to see this while I'm here yeah. visiting with you. We have a dealer here. Because I think once you see it, you know if it's the right one or not. Absolutely. So yeah. this may not make the list, but if I see jury's it- Jury's out on it right now. Jury's out on that, so I'll put that right there. So then- What else we got? <clears throat> we're getting down to- Higher, some higher end stuff. Yeah, so this is a Glashute Panoramic Lunar Blue Dial and um, Moon Phase. And particularly, I've always been intrigued by the Moon Phase. Mm -hmm. And particularly living, living in Alaska, the Moon is a prominent point of our life. Yeah. Um, and so the only thing I worry about this watch is its thickness. It's kind of a slab it's side. A, it's a straight down. Yeah. And I, I have always been drawn to watches that have some profile to it, yeah. some easing of the edges so that I don't feel like it's so big on my wrist, and that's what one of the things I like about this watch. Yeah. So the, it may not make may not make. You it, want to see it in person. I want to see it in person, but I think when I look at the specs and I look at the videos, that this looks like an outstanding buy. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's in there in the range. When I saw the the uh, Vacheron overseas, I thought that's my watch. Yeah. And then I saw the price. <laughs> so <clears throat> if there's some miracle that I'm able to afford an $18,000 watch. And this is a current model. Yeah, Gen, it, Gen 4, right? It's a blue dial. I love the de design of the bracelet. I love the design of the watch head. And I think this could be a timeless watch that I would really love. Yeah. Um, but I think this might price me out of my Well, range. you have to be realistic about what is, uh, you know, what's reasonable. You know, are you willing to service this every couple of years and spend that premium as opposed to servicing your Seamaster, what, like every seven or eight years? And it's not gonna be the same price as, you know, there's there's yeah. costs associated and, and such. And I think there's an important thing to note, like if you're, if you're looking at this and you say, oh, that is the one that speaks to me, but it's outside of what I'm comfortable spending, Part of, part of us says, all right, well, what could I find in my budget that's similar? And sometimes that's a mistake. Like you're trying to replace something with You'll something else. Happy. Like the GP Laurieto, it's a great watch you can get for under 7,000 usually used. But when you put the side by side next to the Vacheron, you go, you know what? That GP is probably a two month ownership and then I cut it loose and I still yeah. want the VC, right? Yeah. So. so. And, and let me say this, the other thing I'm looking for is a dress watch. Okay. I've got my dive watch, I'm happy with it, this is it. Now I'm looking for my dress watch that I might wear two to three times a week. Yeah. Okay, this is my dress watch with BD with clients. Gotcha. Okay? I don't want to go to the meeting with my... Seamaster. Seamaster. But if <laughs> or, I went to the... My, or an Orient Bambino. Or Bambino. <laughs> Although, I will say... It looks nice. It's a great buy. Yeah. And if uh, you have any uh, subscribers out there that are looking for a nice dress watch. I do not think you can beat this for the money. It's just a classic. Yeah. And so I look at the Vacheron and I go, wow, I wish I could afford that. But I'm going to keep it in there in case something happens, yeah. right? So, and the other watch I've been looking at <clears throat> is the uh, Cartier Santos, the XL and the blue dial. It's a new model. It's got a date. And the thing that I like about it is typically the, the, San, the Cartier watches were always printed black and white sure. watches. Yep. And then I saw this with the blue, which actually goes with the blue gemstone. Yeah, it matches this, well. It matches very well. Yeah. And then this this company came out with this band that's a quick release. Yep. It's easy to change links. Without a tool. Without a tool. Mm -hmm. And then I like the raised metal mm -hmm. on the blue. That again, they're printed before. There's loom in the dial and on the hands. And so the only thing that worries me is it's too big. 
Yeah. And that's why I have to see it in person. I agree. Now, I could see, I saw, what did we see the other day? We saw a JLC. A JLC reverse up. <laughs> yep. One, I didn't think I was going to like that. Once I saw that in person, I pretty much feel that's the top of my list. Yeah. This could do the same thing if I saw it in person. It's got a curved, you think about the design, and it's interesting, I've ended up with some rectangular watches. Yeah. And you think about the history of watch design, the best piece of equipment to put on your wrist is a rectangle. But it's, com it's uh, complicated with the movement which wants to be round. Mm -hmm. Do what JLC does is they have movements that work within the rectangle. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a second. So that's, I would say the, uh, the Cartier is in my top three. Mm -hmm. The other one that's in my top three is a Grand Saker, and I'll tell you why. There is nothing like looking at the movement of that second hand. The spring drive. On the spring drive. Yeah. And when I had that other Grand Seiko, I was always looking at that second hand. Yeah. And, uh, and again, that technology, maybe we're not sure about how its longevity, but so far it's been great. Well, it's been around for what, 30 years now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I like about Grand Seiko is you get the artisan feel because it's yeah. hand brushed hand polished and that's hard to do on the numbers that they produce so I, I don't I like think, that. I don't think anybody makes styles better than Grand Seiko yeah. and what I like about them is they relate their dial design to nature mm -hmm. they do and not just strictly visual so there's a reason why they design it like this and so there's actually a new a, a new collection a seasons collection and there's a winter series that I like very much and it has a blue a blue hand and I having had, had that Grand Seiko before I know it's not it's going to be beautiful yeah you know the finishing is going to be beautiful and you know you're ready for that level of I'm ready now. for it now yeah. and so if that's that is a fantastic dress watch mm -hmm. so that is uh, that's in the running that's in the running and so yeah. that leaves us with uh, the the reverso, the reverso. and <clears throat> there's a couple things I like about the reverso and one is that I'm an architect and I actually use what is called the golden section yeah. when I design things. They did that in this design where there is a law of proportions yep. that we find in nature that they are using their, their, their design and it makes sense to me when you have something that's on your wrist, if it's designed according to your human body scale, mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Well, the other thing, the other thing that I... I identify with this. I know some of you guys do as well. The history of the brand and the model brings a little something special. Like that's one of the reasons why people love Speedmaster so much. And definitely with the Reverso and with the Cardia, you know, you're basically your first sport men's watch aviation piece. Really cool history there. And the Reverso as well with being a, basically a polo design, a designed watch for people to play polo with. They can right. turn it over and protect the crystal and, and still play their sport. So yeah. there's something to be said also with the history that some other brands won't have. Not that that takes them out of contention fully, but the, the history does bring a little bit of something, I think. Yeah. So. And what I love about the, the Reverso is the fact that you can take a watch face and flip it yeah. and you have something else. In yeah. particular, the one I'm drawn to are the ones that actually show the movement. Mm -hmm. And it makes absolute perfect sense. I mean, yeah. we have the exposed case back on how many watches. But you, you have know, to take it off. You have to take it off and okay, that looks great. And then you put it back on. Well, what if I wanted to, to maybe wear it for half a day? Look at the movement. Yeah. They designed these movements to be looked at. Yeah. And it's a great design that you have this watch and it's beautiful on one side and you flip it over it's still and beautiful. you wear it and then you, you sort of see the engine yeah. of how it works. And so I've come down to this, uh, the 976 has a great movement, it's a manual one, and then there's a moon phase mm -hmm. that they have. Now, I would call myself a novice with watches. And so what I found with the Reese Reversos is you really have to study these watches. Yeah. There are so many different types. Sizes, complications. Yeah, sizes, complications. And this is probably in the seven thousand dollar range. I'm willing to save for a year, yeah. you know, to, to get the right one. To get the right one. And so, by having seen that one at the jewelry store the other day, I'm almost convinced that this may be the one. But you still need to see the you still need to see the Cartier. Yeah. And 
you know, I don't think enough can be said with trying something on and seeing it in the, in the flesh because it's so different from pictures and even videos here on YouTube. Yeah. It really makes a difference. So in the end, I, I would have a really great dive watch and I have a really great dress watch. Even though this is yeah. actually a sport watch, Technically. but it looks like a dress watch. Yeah. Um, and I would be happy with that. I think I'd be happy with that. Yeah. Um, and again, it's going to be yours someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings up another, uh, another point here. Can you ever really reach contentment? Like you get your two at that point, do you think, well, maybe I should get a chronograph or maybe I should do this or that. I mean, at what point do you, can you really stop? Do you think that's possible? I think so. Unless again, I, I, there's another watch I've always been drawn to that maybe there's a third watch just, yeah. just to have. Yeah. And it's kind of surprising. It's the Seiko Tuna SB033. Oh, yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. Because I, as a designer, I look at that watch and I can see why it's designed the way it is. Absolutely. And to me, boy, you know what? I might like to have that because it's a yeah. great design. It doesn't look anything like this dive watch. Sure. But it is a great design and again, the loom, all the things about that watch yeah. are very interesting. And those ones wouldn't be nearly at the price point as some of these other right. ones. So they're fairly easier to attain down the line. I, right. I definitely can, can see that. Yeah. I think that's good. Let me point out one more thing. Okay. Is one of the things that, you know, I, I mentioned that this Omega, it took me a couple of weeks, a month before I decided this is great. Mm -hmm. be, and, and some of the reasons are it's a totally redesigned watch. And the pre previous uh, watches had that, that hour hand that was like a little stud. Yeah, it was a lot more diminutive. I, I always felt like someday this watch is going to be redesigned. Yeah. And I will say this about Grand Seiko. I'm waiting for the next snowflake. I think someday there's going to come a watch out of that company that's going to be the next snowflake. Yeah. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> uh, but having, you know, having the Seamaster, and I, when I first saw the wave dial, I thought that's very immature design. Yeah. It doesn't look like anything like the other waves of the Seamasters, which I thought were really intricate. But again, as I have worn this, I have grown to love that design. Yeah. And so let me say this to you, Mark Goldberg, you bought the wrong Omega. That blue, <laughs> that blue dial is ugly. So <laughs> the, the blue bezel silver dial. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So again, this to me, the black and white is classic and it takes time and if you buy the wrong colorway you're not going to like it and then yeah. then, you're, months later, then you're going to say that whole line is no good so be very careful everybody when you uh, look at a watch that you give it some time you give it some time to so you can evaluate it really really well and i did that with this and now i know i'm confident that this was the right watch for me yeah so well i think we had a nice time going through your thought process I think a lot of people can relate to uh, to what you do here. Uh, thanks for letting me kind of talk with you. It's been fun. Um, <laughs> hopefully you guys enjoyed meeting the other Bruce, Bruce Williams. Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching today and we'll see you in the next video.